Pastor Javen will continue the series called Exodus from Exile, exploring the stories of Ezra and Nehemiah. This morning we'll look at what happens when our faith faces opposition. So take a moment now and prepare your heart for today's service. As you're standing with me this morning, I just want to read the words of John as he began his gospel. In John chapter 1, talking about Jesus, he said, In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Him, and nothing was created except through Him. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness. And hear this this morning. And the darkness can never extinguish it. Amen. Father, we celebrate you today. And we know today, God, we we take your word and we seal it in our hearts today. Believing and knowing that even though we live in a culture and a world that's constantly trying to dampen the word of God. Extinguish the word of God. Extinguish the life that Jesus Christ has brought us through his death and his resurrection. That, Father, the darkness can never extinguish the light of God. And we thank you for that today. And we pray, Father, that as we dive into your word more together this morning, that your word would be planted deep into our hearts and deep into our souls and deep into our minds. That every day that we live, we live through the strength of your word. And we thank you for it today. We give you praise in all things. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, when, uh, when you, if you're a person that watches movies or you watch television shows or you're, you like to read a story or nowadays you listen to stories, if you like any of that, when you're involved in a story, if you notice one thing about characters in those stories that you notice, especially if the story's good, is that character, the main character is a group of people that are going to face opposition. In fact, writers tell you if there's no opposition, then there's no story. One writer said it this way. They said that opposition creates stakes. It creates a journey. It creates something to be resolved. And that opposition, that thing that you're trying to see happen, that's what sucks you in, right? That's what draws you in to see what will happen, what will take place, what will play out in this story. It's what makes a story. Without it, there is no story. So when we're watching movies, we're watching television shows, when we're reading or listening to a story, we like the fact that there's opposition. In life, however, we don't like opposition, do we? Because opposition in life creates tension. It creates stress. It creates anxiety. It creates fear. It creates drama. And all of those are things that none of us want to live with right? We don't want that in our life. We don't want those things in our life. But here's a guarantee that you already know, that I know, that everybody knows, watching online knows. In life, you face opposition, right? You've probably, you've probably faced opposition this week. You've probably faced opposition throughout, maybe through the month. You, you're facing opposition right now in your life. And here's what you need to know too, because sometimes when people come to follow Christ and they come to God, they think that because I follow Christ, then now I no longer face opposition. That's not true. As you follow Christ, we still continue to face opposition. In fact, the opposition may even get stronger. Because as you follow Christ, until Jesus returns, there's a spiritual enemy that will always be against your faith and against the God that you follow. So he's going to be against you and he's going to constantly be attacking your life. That's why you, you will we'll say from time to time, you know, following Jesus, it's not that it makes necessarily life better. It makes us the way we handle life better. And so there's a difference there, but we're going to face opposition. I mean, right after Jesus was, began his earthly ministry, when he's baptized and God spoke over him and said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And he went into the wilderness to pray and to fast for 40 days. As soon as he got done with his fast at a very weak moment in his life, the devil attacked him. He came in and he tempted him and attacked him. 
He constantly faced attack. Early in his ministry, the demons were trying to reveal who he was so that they can plot quicker against him and who he was. The contemporaries around him, the people that, that he was talking to, they plotted against him. They, they, they were against him. They were constantly trying to trap him and trick him and get, and get him to, to, to what they call blaspheme God. He was eventually killed. He was eventually placed on a cross. And even when he was on the cross... And their, their, their attempt to kill him was taking place. They were still mocking him. They were still jeering him. They were still hailing insults at him. And they were saying, look, he saved others, but he can't save himself. But here's the thing. Jesus never came for that purpose. He actually came to give his life away so that he could save others. So what they thought they were plotting against and stopping, they were actually playing a part in it coming to pass and the glory of God being revealed. And that's what happens often in our opposition, in the spiritual opposition that we face in our life. Why do we constantly face this opposition? Because it's what John was talking about. There is a darkness in our culture and a darkness in our world because of a spiritual enemy that reigns over this world that is a constantly trying to extinguish the light of God within us. That's constantly coming against that, constantly trying to fight that. And when you are a follower of Christ, you're going to face opposition to your faith. Because as Peter said, there is an enemy that is prowling. And he's looking for someone to devour. Jesus lived a perfect life. He was a perfect person and he still had enemies. Right? So life's not going to be any different for us. So I just want to encourage us this morning. I want to look at a few verses from the, from the word of God this morning to encourage us. All right. Let's look at John chapter 16, verse 33. Just let this encourage you today. This is Jesus. The words of Jesus. He said this, he said, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me here on earth. You're going to have many trials and sorrows. Jesus said, but take heart because I've overcome the world. Then look at this. This is the words of Peter. First Peter chapter four, uh, verse 12. He says, dear friends, do not be surprised by the fiery trials that you go through as if it's something that were strange happening to you. In other words, when the stuff happens to you, don't be surprised. And then look at the words of Paul to his protege, Timothy, second Timothy chapter three, verse 12. He said, yes. Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will face persecution, will suffer persecution. So just be encouraged today if you're following Christ. Just let that encourage you. It's it's there because we have an enemy that is constantly against us. But know this, when, when, when you face opposition to your faith, the, fa- the opposition that you face is not attack- an attack against you or what you want. The opposition to your faith is an attack against what God wants to do in you and what God wants to do for you. It's always an attack on God and his purposes and his plans. So when you begin to follow Christ, when you are a follower of Christ, you have to pre-decide some things in your life. You have to pre-decide a few things. I want to show you a few of these things that you have to pre-decide that's going to take place in your life. The one, number one thing that you have to pre-decide in your life is that the word of God will be your primary guidance in this life. That you are primarily in everything in your life, you're going to be led by the word of God. The other thing that you need, another thing that you need to be a pre-decide in your life is you need to say, I am not going to get distracted. I am not going to get diverted from how God has called me to live this life and what God has called me to do in this life. I'm not going to let myself get diverted. I'm not going to let myself get distracted. I'm not going to be discouraged. And the third thing you need to decide is I will not let fear have a place in my heart. Now, that's a lot easier said than done. I get it. Because listen, when I look and I see and I read articles uh, about things that are going on in the world, fear will try to rise up, right? And you might have moments of fear, but the thing is you cannot let fear build a place to reside and live in your heart and your life. You cannot give it place to stay. So as we move along in our journey in Ezra and Nehemiah, we're going to see that these people that came back to rebuild the temple, rebuild the wall, they faced opposition in their life. They faced opposition as they tried to do these things that God had called them to do. Remember, God stirred their hearts. God stirred the hearts of pagan kings to release them. God stirred their hearts to move back 
into this place, back from where they were exiled from because of the sin in their life, had taken captive in Babylon. Now they were being released some 70 more or plus years later to go back into their homeland. And God had given them a purpose. God had given them something to do. But as they move in, they begin to face this opposition. And we've seen over these last three weeks, we have seen a group of people that have prayed and spent time in prayer and focused their attention on God. They have spent time worshiping God and making him the center of, of, of their heart and their desires. They have spent time working hard for God. We've seen them doing this. But even in the midst of how hard they pray, in the midst of how hard they worship, in the midst of the, 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 the working together and being together and planning and preparing and, and being of one mind and unified, the opposition keeps coming, the opposition keeps happening. And in Ezra, if you read Ezra chapter four through six, we see that Zerubbabel and the people that were building the temple of God faced opposition as they were building the temple. So just real quick, let's look at a, a few verses from Ezra chapter four as, to, to see the opposition that they faced as they were building this temple. Ezra chapter four, sorry, verse one, the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were rebuilding a temple to the Lord, the God of Israel. So they approached Zerubbabel and the other leaders and said, let us build with you for we worship your God just as you do. We have sacrifices to him. We've sacrificed to him ever since King Esarhaddon of Assyria brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the other leaders of Israel replied, you can have no part in this work. We alone will build the temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, just as King Cyrus of Persia commanded us. Then the local residents tried to discourage And frighten the people of Judah to keep them from their work. They bribed agents to work against them and to frustrate their plans. This went on during the entire reign of King Cyrus of Persia and lasted until King Darius of Persia took the throne. So they're facing opposition. Now, when we first read this and we get into this initially, it doesn't sound like they're facing opposition, does it? Because you've got a group of people that comes to them and says, hey, we want to build with you because we worship the same God that you worship. But the problem with that was that was a twisted truth. And a twisted truth is not truth. Because just a quick historical lesson and a quick biblical lesson, if you go back to 2 Kings chapter 17, you see that when Assyria, we know this is true, history tells us it's true, Assyria attacked the northern kingdom first. The northern kingdom fell before the southern kingdom fell to Babylon. The northern kingdom fell to Assyria. When Assyria attacked the northern kingdom, they took the people of God captive. They brought them back to Assyria. They took Assyrians and they sent Assyrians to live in the northern kingdom. A lot of them primarily in the region of Samaria. In 2 Kings chapter 17, the people of Samaria that went of Assyria that went to live in Samaria found out that there was obviously a certain way that God expected you to live when you lived in that land because they weren't living that way. And all of a sudden lions came and devoured them. So some people went back to the king of Assyria and said, hey king, apparently, this is Javan's translation, there's a certain way we have to live because if we don't, lions will eat us. So we need to know how we are to live while we're living in this land. So the king allowed a priest that they had taken captive from Israel to go back to Israel. But the only reason he was there was to teach them the laws of God and how they're supposed to live according to the laws of God. So what the people of Assyria did living in Samaria is they added the laws of God to their lifestyle. So that they wouldn't be eaten by lions. All right. So they wouldn't die in these ways. And so they added it to their life. That's why they said, we, we worship this Lord, your God too. We follow this God's commands too. We make sacrifices too. When we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, but God doesn't want the sacrifice, right? It's not the sacrifice is just a show of your sacrifice and your service and your, what was the key word? Obedience. God wants your obedience. He wants your heart. But all they were doing was just adding the laws. And this, when you get into the New Testament, you start seeing the Samaritans. This is where you see the difference in the problem with the Samaritans and the Pharisees because the Samaritans became those who had a life that just added the laws of God to their life. It was blended. They weren't, 
they were people that had moved in from Assyria. And so this is what is happening. But blended worship, blended faith is not pure worship. It's not pure faith. And Zerubbabel knew that. And so he said to them, he said, no, you're not going to have a place in helping us build the temple of God, which is the place where the presence of God resides. Because we're not going to taint the work of God with blended faith. So we have to be on guard. We have to be on guard, not against a world that is vehemently against the word of God and and, and God in our life, but we have to be on guard against subtle compromises that would try to twist the word of God in our life and deceive us. We remember Jesus had Judas within his 12, right? He had the one who would turn him in to the Pharisees. He was a core part of his 12. He was within the group. The enemy's smart. He's conniving. He doesn't just come at you from right in front of you. He works from within as well. I mean, look at what Paul warned the leaders of the church of Ephesus. When he was on one of his missions, he started the church of Ephesus. He was then was leaving to continue on in his missionary journey. We see it in Acts chapter 20, verse 20, so verse 28. Look at what he says. He says, guard yourselves and God's people, feed and shepherds God's flock, his church, purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ, over which the Holy Spirit has pointed you as leaders. Talking to the leaders. Go on to verse 29, verse 30. He says, I know that false teachers, teachers like vicious wolves will come in among you after I leave, not sparing the flock. Even some men from within your own group will rise up and distort the truth in order to draw a following. Paul was warning him, look, this is how the enemy works. He will twist the truth of the word of God, even amongst the people within the body of God to distort and deceive the people of God. That's what the enemy does. I mean, when when he attacked Jesus in the wilderness after he prayed and fasted, that's exactly what he did. He tried to manipulate and twist the word of God. It's exactly what he did to Adam and Eve that caused the whole fall. He twisted the word of God. And it brought sin into this life. It's the whole reason, that the, one of the reasons that the Holy Spirit is a part of our life. So that we have discernment. So we can discern the truth of God's word and when we're being deceived. It, it, that's why we've been praying and why we've been saying from the very beginning of the year, the importance of praying the words that Paul wrote to Colossians. God, that I may know you and understand you and have a knowledge of you so that I can gain spiritual wisdom and understanding for this life. Spurgeon defined discernment this way. He said discernment is, is, is the, it's not knowing the difference between right and wrong. Discernment is knowing the difference between right and almost right. Because it's the almost right that gets us. But guess what? The almost right is still wrong. We have to have discernment. So opposition is not always going to come straight on. It comes from within as well. And when you stand against oppositions, what happens to Zerubbabel and these guys? When you stand opposition, unfortunately, it will often just get stronger. It'll get louder. It'll get bigger. And when you go on and you read in Ezra 4, Ezra 5, Ezra 6, the opposition kept coming. And eventually they were discouraged and they stopped building the temple. And they went back and they started building their homes instead where they were going to live rather than where the presence of God was going to live. But if you look at Haggai chapter 1, the prophet Haggai actually comes to the people comes to Zerubbabel, comes to the people, and he reminds them of the whole purpose they came back to the nation in the first place. And that was for God to use them to rebuild the temple. It was God's word that came. And when God's word come, God comes, God's word doesn't fail. So Zerubbabel and the people, they got back to work. And we see in Ezra chapter five, look at this real quick. Ezra chapter five, start at verse three. They start rebuilding again, but it says, but, uh, but Tatanae, governor of the province west of the Euphrates River and Shethar Bozani and their colleagues soon arrived in Jerusalem and they asked, who gave you permission to rebuild this temple and restore the structure? And they also asked for the names of all the men, 
working on the temple. That was to cause them to fear. But because their God was watching over them, the leaders of the Jews were not prevented from building until it, until a report was sent to Darius and he returned his decision. So what happens is the people said, you know, you know what? We've been reminded. This is the word of God. This is what we've been called to do. We're going to keep working on it. And so they let the people send a report to Darius. And Darius does some research on his own and Darius finds out, no, King Cyrus did allow them to build that temple. It sends word back and they say, and tells the people, they were allowed to build the temple. They can build it. So Zerubbabel and the people continue to build the temple. But here's, but what happens at first? God's word is attacked. God's word to the people is attacked. And because God's word was attacked, God's work got stalled. God's word is always the center of an attack. The enemy wants to attack the word of God. And when we allow ourselves to be deceived or discouraged, when God's word over us and God's word to us is attacked, God's work in us and God's work through us will be stalled. But that's where we have to remember God's word never fails. And if God's word never fails, God's work should never stop. See, Nehemiah and the people who were rebuilding the wall, they faced the same struggles as Zerubbabel and them rebuilding the temple faced. Nehemiah was confronted by a guy named Sanballat. And just like all good bullies, they had minions. Sanballat has his, his little friend that follows him around. He was a guy by the name of Tobiah. Well, eventually we find that the opposition grows and they begin to, begin to be attacked by the Arabs and the Ashmedites as we see them. Now, here's what's interesting about that. When Sambalat, Sambalat was from Persia. Persia was to the north. Tobiah was an Amorite. He, he was from the east. The Arabs were from the south and the Ashmedites were Philistines and they were from the west. Nehemiah and the people who were building the wall were literally surrounded by opposition. It was coming at them from every direction in their life. And the opposition kept coming. It kept getting louder and it kept growing. In Nehemiah chapter two, you see where the opposition starts from Sam Ballin and Tobiah. And it's personal against Nehemiah and against the leaders who are wanting to rebuild. In Nehemiah chapter four, when they get to work and they're rebuilding after Nehemiah three, we read that a few weeks ago in Nehemiah four, where they're doing the work, Sam Ballot and Tobiah come back even angrier and they come back even louder. And this time it gets public. They publicly begin jeering and mocking. And then we see a little later in Nehemiah chapter four, that the mobs start coming. The Arabs, the Ashmedites, it gets louder, it gets bigger and the anger grows even more. Because whatever God is trying to build, the enemy is always trying to destroy. Jesus said it this way. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Simply put. So whatever God is trying to build in your life, through your life, whatever God is trying to build in his church, through his church, the enemy is going to try to destroy it. That's his purpose. That's what he wants to do. So we see this opposition. And, and the tactics are not different than the tactics that take place against Zerubbabel. It's not any different than the tactics that take place from the very beginning up until now. What the enemy tries to do is the enemy tries to come and he tries to bring discouragement. Then he tries to deceive. He tries to get people to compromise, to manipulate. Ultimately, through all of it, bringing fear. Because the enemy knows if he can discourage the word of God over you, then he can delay the work of God through you. He knows that if he can get you to tolerate certain sin and compromise the work of God, then he can taint the work of God through you. He knows that if he can paralyze you by fear, then he can cripple the work of God in you. That's his tactics. That's what he's trying to do. That's what he was constantly trying to do against Nehemiah and against these people. And as a follower of Christ, here's what we need to know. You need to know that as a follower of Christ, there are going to be things that you are for that the world is against. There are going to be things in this life that you are against that the world is for. That that comes with being a follower of Christ. Now there's a tension that comes there. Because we know as a follower of Christ, we are supposed to be for others. 
that we're told to even love our enemies. And if we're going to love our enemies, that means that we're for them and we have to care for them. We, we are considering the betterment of their life, which is why we talked about what we said last week. And while we'll talk more about it within the body of Christ next week, that tolerance is the opposite of repentance. And in this world, there are things that we can't be tolerant of because we know that those things are destroying and where the culture in the world calls it intolerance and they call it hate. That's not, it's not hate. It's actually love because we know the thing that the thing, not the person, the thing that we're intolerant of is bringing destruction. And so that's why Paul was very careful in his letters to write and to tell the people, your fight is not against flesh and blood. It's not against the people that you come in contact with every day. Your fight is against the principalities and the powers of the air. It's against, is a spiritual battle. But there are things in this world that are trying to destroy people's lives. And that's why there are things that as followers of Christ, we say we can't be tolerant of that life or that thing. Jesus himself said it this way. In Matthew chapter 9, Matthew wrote these words. He said it this way. He said, when Jesus heard this, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. Then he added, now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I've come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. In other words, there has to be a recognition in our life that there are things that are not right. And those things that are not right, if they are allowed in our life, they make us sick. And they're trying to destroy. And God is saying, you need to recognize that as what it is and realize I've come for you and I've come to bring healing and I've come to bring life. So I love Nehemiah's response. I love the way he responds to the opposition. Let's just look at a few quick verses from Nehemiah and how he responds to this opposition that he faces. Nehemiah chapter four, starting at verse four, this is what Nehemiah did. Then I prayed, hear us, O our God, for we're being mocked. May their scoffing fall back on their own heads and may themselves, they themselves become captives in a foreign land. Do not ignore their guilt. Do not blot out their sins for they have provoked you to anger here in front of the builders. And at last, the wall was completed to half its height around the entire city for the people had worked with enthusiasm. Then jump down to verse 13. Verse 13, it says, So I placed armed guards behind the lowest parts of the wall in the exposed areas. I stationed the people to stand guard by families, armed with swords, spears, and bows. Then as I looked over the situation, I called together the nobles and the rest of the people and said to them, Don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord who is great and glorious and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and their homes. Because what you're, what you are defending is bigger than just yourself. In chapter six, you jump to chapter six, verse two. I love this phrase, this statement. So Sam Ballot and Geshen sent a message asking me to meet them at one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But I realized they were plotting to harm me. So I replied by sending this message to them. This is something we need to hold in our heart. I am engaged in a great work. I cannot come. I can't get down from the wall that God has called me to build. I can't stop building what God has called me to build. I can't waste time coming to you about this. Why should I stop working to come and meet with you? Four times they sent the same message and each time I gave the same reply. Nehemiah says, I'm not going to stop doing. Basically what Nehemiah did is Nehemiah just prayed and he kept working. And he kept defending. And too often, instead of doing what Nehemiah did, we respond to opposition with anger, with despair, with fear, with anxiety, with hopelessness. And the way we respond to that opposition, it doesn't help us in our own faith and it doesn't help the faith itself. And I think that Nehemiah probably remembered the words of Solomon 
who wasn't long before him in Proverbs chapter 24, verse 10, he made this statement. He said, if you fail under pressure, your strength is too small. And Nehemiah had to remind himself and he had to remind the people, our strength is not in ourselves. Our strength is in God who stirred us, who moved us, who called us, who purposed us. Our strength is in him. And I think he probably remembered these words from Solomon too. Proverbs chapter 29. He says, fearing people is a dangerous trap, but trusting the Lord means safety. So in other words, I'm not going to let what all these voices around me are saying, keep me from doing what God has called me to do. I'm going to do what, what they've been doing from the get go. I'm going to remember the promises of God. I'm going to remember that my strength is in him. I'm going to keep praying. I'm going to keep living for him. I'm going to keep working for him. And I'm just going to ask God, you deal with them. It's not my place to deal. God, you deal with them. They don't entertain mocking with mocking. When Jesus was on the cross and he was constantly being mocked, he did not throw back mocking to them. Instead, he prayed and he said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. They're clueless. They're lost. And the whole reason Jesus was on on that cross was for them. In the face of their mocking, he was giving his life so that they, if they would come to him, they would have life. And what's amazing is we go on in the New Testament, we find many of them did. They gave their life to the one that they mocked on the cross. How awesome is that? Do not allow yourself to become so consumed by spiritual opposition that all you, all you think about, all you constantly go towards is the opposition. Instead, focus on what God has called you to, the opportunities he's called you to, the people he's called you to, the responsibilities he's called you to. Keep praying, keep building what he's called you to build, and keep defending the faith that and the hope that you have in your heart. But remember how you are called to defend that. Real quick, here's a reminder for how we're called to defend our hope and defend our faith. First Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Peter wrote these words. He said, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. If someone asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. And then look at what he says. Do this in a gentle and respectful way. He says, and keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they'll be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Remember, it's better to suffer for doing good. In other words, who cares if they're const- if you're continuing to obey God, let them halt. Let them throw out their insults. Suffer for doing good, if that's what God wants. It's better to do that than to suffer for doing wrong. Because that suffering comes eternally. Then look at what Paul wrote in his letter to the Romans. Romans chapter 12, says, Dear friends, never take revenge. Don't take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. And then he says this, instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. And doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their head. In other words, they will regret what they say about you because of how much you love them. He says, don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. And then, Look at these words that Paul wrote again to his protege, Timothy, second Timothy chapter two it says again, I'd say, don't, 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 don't get involved in foolish, ignorant arguments that only start fights. The servant of the Lord must not quarrel must be kind to everyone, be able to teach and be patient with difficult people. Gently instruct those who oppose the truth. And perhaps God will change those people's hearts and they will learn the truth. I love that phrase. And I've used that before. When people have tried to stir up stuff and argue with me about things, I say, look, Paul told Timothy to avoid foolish and dumb arguments. So I'm not going to fall into this. I'm not going to get into this argument because all it does is it wastes time doing what God has called us to do. Years ago, I heard Charles Stanley make this statement. This is, this is his life philosophy. He said, everything he does, his whole life is lived this way. 
He said, my, my philosophy is this. I obey God and then I'll leave the consequences to him. That's it. And I'm like, man, that's simple, but it works. Just obey God. And leave all the consequences and everything else that happens, everything else that plays out, everything else that takes place, leave it to God and let him handle it. He can deal with it. So what does your response to opposition reveal about you and reveal about your heart? The way that you respond to opposition. Have you allowed opposition to take you off the wall? Have you allowed it to take you off from continuing to work and continuing to build what God has called you to build? Have you allowed it to take you to, 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 to stop the work of God that the work of God wants to do in you? Or in the face of opposition, have you gotten down on your knees? Have you prayed? Have you trusted the situation? Have you trusted everything to God himself? And instead, you just keep praying, you keep working, and you keep defending with gentleness, with humility, with hope, what you are doing in your life. See, we have to remember, like Nehemiah told the people, the whole reason we stand, it's bigger than us. It's not just for me. It's for our sons. It's for our daughters. It's for our community. It's for the generations to come. The whole reason I'm not going to allow the word of God to be tainted, the word of God to be twisted It's not just for me. It's for the generations to come. It's bigger than us. God's work is bigger than us. And Nehemiah tells us as we go on, we're going to look at this in a couple of weeks, that Ezra came and he opened up the word of God. And when he did, a great renewal and a great awakening took place within the people. It was a powerful move of God within the nation. And Malachi would come later and he would prophesy. You can see it in Malachi chapter three. He would prophesy that eventually because of the temple that they rebuilt and the wall that they built, Jesus Christ himself, God, the Lord would come and he would enter into that temple. See, Jesus would eventually come and he would walk through the gate that those people built in spite of opposition. He would come and he would walk through the doors that they built in spite of opposition. He would come and he would enter into that temple in spite of opposition. Paul said that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the temple of God. When you keep praying, when you keep working, when you keep building, when you keep defending you, the hope that you have with gentleness, with humility, you are opening a gate. You are opening a door. You are inviting Jesus Christ himself to live, to reside, to be in your temple. And not only that, you may be opening a door for him to find a new temple as well. And when Jesus enters, everything changes. It's what happened when he came to this earth. Everything changed. And it's what happens when he comes in our life. Everything changes. Because Jesus changes everything. If you need prayer in any way today, we would love for you to reach out to us. You can go to our website, bwccanbin.com, go to our contact page. You'll find the link there to uh, request prayer or send us anything that you uh, would like to communicate with us today. Or you can also simply text the word prayer to 803-676-7566. And we will be back in touch with you to find out how we can be in prayer for you. God bless you. We hope that you have a great week.